This particular aircraft is the McDonnell XF-85 Goblin and has been hailed as the strangest airplane ever built. In an era of aeronautical research boom, the United States Army Air Forces approved the creation of what is known as a parasite fighter. This small aircraft was designed to be ejected from a Convair B-36 Peacemaker with the aim of combating interceptor attackers and protecting its mothership. Once the mission was complete, the small and peculiar fighter would return and reattach to the bomber it came from. Despite sounding far-fetched, the concept had already been conceived in the 1930s but resurfaced at the end of World War II with the onset of the Cold War, as a new generation of bombers was being developed, and their escort fighters were becoming obsolete. The promise of revolutionizing aerial combat seemed about to happen, and that's what we're going to tell you in this military aviation video. Fasten your seatbelts, and let's get started. Let's first contextualize why there was a need for an aircraft of these characteristics. During the Allied air offensive against Nazi Germany in World War II, U.S. bombers like the B-17 Flying Fortress, B-24 Liberator, and B-29 Super Fortress faced fierce opposition from Luftwaffe interceptor planes. The U.S. Army Air Forces developed long-range escort fighters like the P-47 Thunderbolt and P-51 Mustang to protect bombers during ambushes. After the war, aeronautical technology evolved, and a new generation of bombers with five times the range was developed. The Boeing B-50 Superfortress and the Convair B-36 Peacemaker were some of these state-of-the-art strategic bombers, but with more powerful aircraft came new challenges. The U.S. Army Air Forces needed a new defense strategy, as their escort fighters were inadequate and unable to defend the new models. In-flight refueling remained a risky concept, pilot fatigue was a genuine concern, and the exorbitant cost of designing new escort fighter planes from scratch was unthinkable. Engineers would have to consider other innovative and creative solutions. With the advent of the Cold War, the idea of the parasite plane was revisited, following the original guidelines but refining some of the concepts. Engineers were pursuing a design that not only met the project's specifications but was also fully operational. Aircraft with these qualities were not a new idea, they had a long and complex history. Parasite planes date back to the 1930s when the U.S. Navy tested the deployment of F-9C Sparrowhawk biplanes aboard 250-meter-long helium-filled airships that used internal hooks to release them from aircraft carriers. However, their history was cut short when the prototype malfunctioned and crashed in 1935. During World War II, the Soviet Union also experimented with parasite planes by mounting I-16 fighters in the bomb bays of TB-3 bombers for aerial attack operations. At the same time, Japan launched rocket-propelled kamikazes from its Mitsubishi G-4M bombers. As seen, it was an idea that initially seemed appealing to all air forces worldwide but eventually became cumbersome in implementation. In early 1945, the U.S. Army Air Forces requested proposals for an ultralight parasite fighter that could fit in the bomb bay of one of their next-generation bombers. Only one company, McDonnell Aircraft, then a young aerospace manufacturing company based in St. Louis, Missouri, submitted a proposal. McDonnell's engineers were eager to test their parasite plane design and quickly submitted a proposal in March. As an original detail, in the initial concept, the fighter would be semi-exposed under the bomber. Unfortunately for the developers, the USAF rejected their proposal because they wanted the parasite to fit entirely inside the bomb bay of AB-36 for protection reasons. The company's design team, led by Herman D. Barkey, then presented an improved redesign. After several revisions, the USAF agreed to proceed with two prototypes of the new aircraft, already christened as XF-85. Although initial plans envisioned the mass production of the plane, the USAF chose to wait for the results of the prototype tests before embarking on mass production. The XF-85 Goblin was named by McDonnell Aircraft's founder, James McDonnell, and the Goblin part was because the CEO liked to name the company's fighters after mythical creatures such as the F-4 Phantom II and the F-2H Banshee. The XF-85 Goblin was an engineering feat, 
being the smallest jet fighter ever built. It measured only 4.5 meters in length, had a wingspan of 6.5 meters, and weighed only 1,500 kilograms. It also had a rounded fuselage and wings that folded backward to fit into the confines of a bomb bay. Despite its compact size, the Goblin was equipped with four 12.7mm machine guns in the nose, making it a perfect bomber protector. In its cockpit, the pilot had an ejection seat, an oxygen bottle, and even a high-speed ribbon parachute. Despite its size, this aircraft was a true Swiss army knife of the skies. Finally, a recovery hook was installed in the aircraft's center of gravity, which retracted in the air, allowing it to return to the mothership. Powered by a Westinghouse J-34 turbojet, the Goblin could be launched from the air at altitudes of up to 48,200 feet. Its fuel reserve was only 400 liters, meaning it could endure only one hour in combat. However, this was not a concern, as the aircraft's performance was maximized because, unlike other fighters, it did not use fuel to reach its altitude. During a wind tunnel test, the first Goblin prototype, serial number 46 to 524, was accidentally dropped from just 40 feet while being held by a crane. The fall damaged its fuselage and air intake, leaving the aircraft almost unusable and requiring extensive repair work. Despite this setback, the second prototype was available and would be used for the rest of the tunnel and flight tests, hoping for better luck than its predecessor. As the B-36 Peacemaker was still in production, all Goblin flight tests were conducted using a converted B-29 Super Fortress mothership with a modified bomb bay and a suitable trapeze for our protagonist. Since the B-29 was smaller than the Peacemaker in the tests, the XF-85 would fly semi-exposed rather than fully inside the bomb bay. Trial tests finally began in the summer of 1948 at Nurok Field South Base. Some tests were conducted with the Goblin attached to the B-29 while being transported in a stowed position, while in other tests, the Goblin was tethered and extended in the B-29's airstream with the engine off so that the pilot could feel the aircraft in flight. The chosen one for the Brave Goblin trial was pilot Edwin Schock, specially selected by McDonnell. A Pennsylvania native, Schock was an experienced helldiver pilot who had earned the Navy Cross for bombing a Japanese battleship during World War II, a more than suitable profile to test this small aircraft. On August 23, Schock was maneuvering the XF-85 when he attempted free flight for the first time after separating from the mothership at an altitude of 20,000 feet. The pilot flew the aircraft autonomously for 10 minutes, demonstrating that the Goblin could reach speeds of up to 400 kilometers per hour. When he tried to reassemble with the bomber, he realized that the small aircraft was very susceptible to the B-29's turbulence and the cushion of air generated by the two aircraft. After three unsuccessful attempts to reattach to the trapeze, Schock miscalculated his approach and hit the Goblin with such force that its cockpit was shattered, tearing off the helmet and oxygen mask. The Goblin started plummeting furiously, but the pilot managed to stabilize the aircraft and landed in a nearby lake, miraculously saving himself. After the unfortunate emergency landing, Goblin flight tests were suspended for over a month to fully repair it. Pilot Shock used the downtime to practice and try to perfect the docking maneuver. To overcome the air damping effect, engineers adjusted its throttle and increased its trim power by 50%. On October 14, 1948, the pilot could finally successfully release the Goblin and reattach to the B-29, but just a week later, Shock had difficulty hooking the Goblin to the bomber's trapeze. He failed four more times before hitting the trapeze bar and breaking the nose hook of the aircraft. Once again, he was forced to make a forced landing at Muroc Field. When the damaged first prototype became available for use again, it was reintegrated into the test program and completed several captive flights, but it presented the same problems as its second version. It seemed that the hooking and unhooking of this model were an unsolvable problem. According to Shock, the Goblin was stable, easy to fly, and also recovered well from spins. 
However, test flights continued to reveal that the turbulence experienced during its approach to the superfortress was a significant problem, so upper and lower fins were added to the Goblin's fuselage to compensate for increased directional instability during the docking maneuver. Still, the hook seemed to be the most serious complication because, despite being in a fixed position in the initial flights, in subsequent flights, it moved from where it should be, making assembly difficult. This action caused an irregular oscillation that added to the already complicated docking maneuver. Small aerodynamic fairings were added to the hook to try to solve the problem and reduce jolts when it extended and retracted. However, once flight tests resumed in the spring of 1949, Schock continued to have difficulty hooking onto the superfortress, and once again, he damaged the aircraft before resorting to another emergency landing. Finally, the premature end of the XF-85 had arrived. The two Goblin prototypes flew a total of seven times, but only three of the flights resulted in a successful docking. Ultimately, the Goblin revealed mediocre performance compared to modern jet fighters, coupled with the demanding piloting skills required for docking. Technology had also caught up, and practical in-flight refueling was already being developed for fighters used routinely as bomber escorts. Furthermore, Soviet jet engines were already surpassing the XF-85, and the United States was working on new long-range escort fighters using wingtip fuel pods. Logically, the U.S. Air Force decided they were no longer interested in continuing the development of the Goblin, and the XF-85 project was officially cancelled on October 24, 1949. Despite the cancellation, the USAF continued to study the parasite plane concept through a series of projects, such as Project MX-106, Project Ficon, and Project Tom Tom. Meanwhile, the McDonnell XF-85 goblins flown by Shock are now pieces in military aviation museums, exhibited as true rarities from another era. We are now reaching the end of this presentation, and we wanted to ask you, what do you think would have happened to the XF-85 if it had continued to be developed? Do you think parasite planes could have become a standard in the defense of larger aircraft? Leave your opinions in the comments below. That concludes today's video, we appreciate you sticking with us until the end and look forward to the upcoming releases of military aviation.